please welcome Tony Griffin. Hey there. Um, so I'm Tony Griffin. I am the director of the JMX Bond Center on Design for the Just City at the City College of New York School of Architecture. And we are pleased to be joined by our collaborators, David Maddox from The Nature of Cities, Ariella Cohen from Next City, uh, to release um, the Just City essays and to frame the panel uh, that you're going to hear now, uh, Visions for the Just City from Around the World. Today, uh, we will feature two of our essayists from this ebook publication, The Just City's 26 Visions for Equity, Inclusion, and Opportunity. The publication, funded by the Ford Foundation and supported by MAS, is a response to the persistence of injustice in the world's cities. As troubling headlines from Ferguson, Missouri, to Baltimore, to Johannesburg, even here in New York City, and a myriad of other cities have made clear over the last 16 to 18 months, dramatic inequalities in income, housing, and safety demand a continued search for ideas and solutions to gaining greater urban justice. The Just City Essays, Volume 1, features 26 authors from the fields of architecture, art, community activism, ecology, government, philanthropy, and urban planning to offer key insights grounded in the realities of 22 global cities. We encourage you, and we're so excited to launch the book today. Uh, you may download the book even while you're listening to this panel at any of the sites listed above. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our sponsor and moderator for this panel, Don Chin, who is the director of Just Cities and Regions for the Ford Foundation. Thank you. How's everyone feeling? Everyone on Twitter. Um, we're delighted to be here. Uh, my first task will be to introduce uh, my uh, fellow speakers here. Uh, so to my immediate left is Cecilia Herzog. Uh, Cecilia is the president and co-founder of the Inverde Institute in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Inverde aims to educate and raise public awareness about the importance of green infrastructure and the role of biodiversity and ecosystem services in cities uh, to build resilience uh, and livability. So welcome. Thank you very much for making the trip. Uh, to uh, her left uh, is Darnell Moore, who is senior correspondent at Mike and co-managing editor of The Feminist Wire. Uh, he is writer in residence at the Center of African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice at Columbia University. Uh, he is also a member of the Black Lives Matter Network. Uh, so welcome. We are delighted to have both of you here. Um, so, as you all can see behind us, um, the Just Cities uh, essays uh, have been sponsored by these wonderful organizations, and I encourage all of you uh, to read them. Uh, Cecilia and Darnell are two of our essayists, and uh, they've given us a lot of very thought-provoking uh, material to consider as we embark on this challenge of really wondering what is a just city. Um, in the front piece, in the Next City uh, version of this, the question is raised, we're now in a, in a decade, or perhaps it's been about a decade and a half in which cities are suddenly hot, they're exciting. People are talking about how to achieve livable cities, sustainable cities, resilient cities, uh, and uh, there are many of us in the world who believe that we also uh, most fundamentally need to address the question about what is a just city. Uh, some of you may think this is a relatively new question, but it's actually a question about as old as civilization itself. Uh, if you go back to Plato's Republic, uh, to the roots of Confucianism, uh, many different um, uh, bases of, of uh, uh, current thought today, uh, this question has been raised time and again. What is a just city? Uh, how do we uh, ensure that people uh, can live uh, with fairness and justice uh, in their society, in, in the place where they live? Um, so, uh, let me begin uh, by asking Cecilia you a question. Um, in your essay, which appears on the Nature of Cities website and in the ebook, uh, you talk about the fundamental linkage between landscape and people. Uh, not just land as a commodity, but really landscape, its functions, its values, and how that has great relevance to human development, uh, to physical well being and emotional well being. I wonder if you can uh, expand on. Uh, just this little blurb that I'm able to offer and, and uh, tell everyone what your thesis is. Um, we have been uh, transforming the landscape since we first started and then uh, um, 
as uh, um, um, getters, uh, uh, hunters, and uh, after that we settled and then we domesticated the landscape, and we tried, uh, we started building in the landscape, and then uh, uh, finally we got like New York. Everything is very built, and then uh, how. Uh, Things still happen in the landscape, uh, all the processes, the natural processes, and uh, how we need the ecosystems in the, in the city, how the, we need nature uh, uh, green everywhere to really cope with uh, all the challenges we have now, um, all the climate change and uh, uh, urban heat island and uh, floods and everything that we're seeing. So we need uh, really to understand that the landscape is much more than a beautiful scenery. I come from Rio and uh, the landscape of Rio is known all, all over, but it's much more than that beautiful uh, picture that we see is where we really live and uh, um, um, do our things and get together. And when a storm hits us, it's terrible because down there, it's, uh, it's all flooded and it's polluted and the air is not clean because of, uh, there's not enough green spaces, uh, quality green spaces that really uh, benefits us, the, uh, um, giving us uh, uh, well-being and uh, quality of life. Mm -hmm. And it's very different where you are. If you are in a, a nice neighborhood, you have much nicer places to be where nature is. And if you go to a, different neighborhood uh, where the landscape is totally sealed, um, then there is a, a much worse uh, uh, quality of life. So people are in, uh, in Brazil, in Rio, uh, all the waters are very polluted. Mm -hmm. So I dream of uh, having um, the green infrastructure. Actually, I'm working, I'm not just dreaming, I'm um, mm -hmm. teaching and researching on how green infrastructure in the city uh, really performing different uh, uh, functions, as you said, uh, can enhance our quality of life for all of us, not just for the, some privilege that uh, face the, the, the waterfronts and everything. So mm -hmm. that's uh, how I'm sorry. Um, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. But it's... I think landscape is, is yeah. uh, the support where we are. Mm -hmm. So um, and I think there's, important. there's increasingly global recognition of the importance of landscape. Uh, as Jeannie Birch and Ana Moreno were talking earlier in a previous panel, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals actually include a target about green space and, and green infrastructure uh, within the, the er so-called urban SDG, the Sustainable Development yes. Goal. And so uh, I think there is increasing awareness across the globe about the importance of the human connection to uh, landscape and nature. So uh, I want to turn my um, uh, question, next question to Darnell. So I really loved your essay. It does what a lot of great writing does for me, which is place images and like a, a narrative arc and a visual uh, narrative in my mind about uh, the, the issues that you're addressing. And you talk about your neighborhood in Bed-Stuy. Uh, and I, I, want, uh, I want to give you an opportunity and ask you about uh, how your lived experience in Bed-Stuy and other places where you travel to, you talk about Ferguson as well, um, how that really informs your view on the link between place, race, and justice. Sure. Um, first, thank you for calling it a great writing. I wasn't <laughs> sure if it was great writing. Um, but I, I want to begin by telling a story. So three weeks ago, I was walking after having celebrated a friend of mine who is a cultural anthropologist. She, she lives three houses down from me. She's a black, uh, black woman who writes about black girls. So get it. We're celebrating a black woman writer, cultural anthropologist, who writes on black girls. And we walk outside to go to the convenience store. Now, we have glasses in our hands. And around this time, I guess it's around 9, and there are police on the corner. This is Bed-Stuy. The street is Marcus Garvey and um, Lewis Avenue. Um, and as we're walking, the police stop us. They ask, what's in our bottles? We say juice. Um, one police officer asks to smell the juice, literally takes the bottle and smells and, and sniffs the, 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 you know, the bottle. Now, I'm, I'm aware of our sort of rights. Um, we let that slide. And as we're walking back to our block, we are stopped. Now the police have accumulated. It's about, it's about seven police on the corner now. Um, it's about 11 PM. And one of the cops screamed at us, make sure you get home safe. To which we go, OK. We plan to. Um, but there was a conversation that ensued that wasn't really nice. Um, and she, the, the, the police officer, uh, and just 
for purposes of illustration, um, with the exception of one, all of those police were, were white. Um, and we walked back and had a conversation. And I'll just be very short. I talked about how our experience as black folk walking through a neighborhood we live in, that we call home, um, might be impacted by the ways in which we're engaged by police, like that example. That resulted in one of the police officers saying, you know, the police uh, who spoke to you first was wrong. Mm -hmm. She was rude. But I, have, I, have to protect, I can't go against her in public, he says. I give you that example um, because I've lived in this neighborhood now for about six years. The number of police officers that, that's, that has increased on our corner um, is pretty astronomical. Um, it's pretty uh, exaggerated. Um, and I started noticing how changes in the neighborhood followed changes in demographic and racial composition. That is, when, for example, we had an incident where two people were robbed, they happened to be white, um, a, a, a wanted sign was placed on a police pole, on a, on a telephone pole, looking for the assailants. That had never happened. Not in all of the shootings, not in all of, of the robberies. And it seemed to me that there was a type of value afforded to certain bodies based on race, based on class, which had me question, well, what is the value of black lives? What is it, does black lives then matter in a space like this, such that when certain bodies come into this neighborhood, now we have 24-hour stores. We did not have 24-hour stores that were open before. We actually have a real estate agent on our street. That may sound like a shock to you, but brownstoners, brownstoner movement, which was organized by black middle class in that neighborhood, could not find real estate agents to sell their homes. So I wanted to follow and trace the connection between the presence of bodies, not just by race, but by class, by gender and sexuality, and the ways in which those bodies seem to be commodified in a certain type of way and afforded value in ways that black bodies and black people are just not. Mm. Right. And um, in the work that we do at the Ford Foundation, we often think about these different dynamics. And what it often comes down to, in, in my experience, working in the US, going to places like uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, and other cities in Brazil, um, much of the challenges that we see in, in trying to foster a just city have to do with uh, contestations over land, over place. Um, as you describe in your essay, Darnell, you talk about how um, there is a certain level of attention that is afforded to places when white people move in, uh, when gentrification takes place. Uh, and those dynamics are really a challenge for us to think about as a society. How do we foster a place where everyone feels welcome, where we can uh, uh, experience some of the uh, some things like safety uh, and a feeling of inclusion and respect um, uh, while these dramatic changes are occurring. Um, I want to turn uh, my next question to you. So there are many essays here, there are many practitioners, different types of people commenting on, on uh, the achievement of Jazz Cities. Um, what are some things that, uh, Cecilia, you're seeing in uh, Brazil uh, in terms of trying to achieve the Jazz City? Uh, there's so many changes occurring. There are these mega events occurring. There's rapid urbanization. Uh, there's a lot of land expropriation uh, in cities and at the edges. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, what do you see as a, as a way forward? Um, that's a hot issue in Rio right now. Very hot to touch the, the, the point. Because uh, land is uh, the most precious uh, asset that the city has. And then now, um, in Rio now, because of the Olympics next year, it's, uh, it's going under a huge transformation. And uh, it's not uh, taking into account neither the people that is already there, neither the, the uh, ecological issues. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, a lot of money is being put in very um, uh, vulnerable places. And then uh, we, will, we are already facing challenges. And people are really fighting against uh, uh, what's happening in many places. There are good things and bad things happening. And uh, I think we are creating uh, more separations mm -hmm. and more unjust uh, places to be. So um, this is uh, uh, it's, it's an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of people working to uh, take up this gap and um, uh, not just uh, doing as a makeup, uh, doing a big park and selling as a good uh, thing for the poor people in the north side of the city. Mm -hmm. 
that has a, 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 a canal that uh, drains all the sewage right next to it mm -hmm. and not incorporating the clean water right behind it. So people will still uh, breathe bad air and uh, have bad water, but they have this big park that they can market as a, a big achievement. And they, uh, they show this as the resilience uh, 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 building of the city. So I think it's, it's uh, something that is it's, uh, very, very interesting. And uh, we need to bring this to a bigger discussion in the city and out of, that's why I'm here also, because mm -hmm. I was invited to come and it was like in my agenda. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going, mm -hmm. because uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something somewhere where I can uh, sp speak out and uh, bring this issue uh, uh, from uh, another perspective, from the outside also not only inside so um, I think I'm bringing this uh, every day I can in Rio mm -hmm. and everywhere I can so um, yeah. yeah I think the landscape could be a big uh, uh, catalyst for mm -hmm. enhancing the city or separating the city yeah, yeah. I, I think that's great and I think we all know that in Brazil social movements have played such an important role in defining uh, urban rights, like the right to housing and many other uh, measures that have been enshrined in the Brazilian constitution. Uh, and uh, I hope that more of this dialogue occurs as we really begin to understand what it really takes to create um, uh, just cities and, and places where you have the human and, and natural interaction. Um, Darnell, I, I want to ask uh, the next question of you. Uh, which is, you know, if you think about social movements in any country, Brazil, the United States, uh, they play such an important role uh, in our civil society. Uh, I think uh, in your essay you talk about how Black Lives Matter is really the perfect platform for addressing uh, a lot of the issues that you raise in the essay and the critique that your friend raised. Um, and um, many, I think, many people are, have been inspired and energized by its rise. Uh, what is next for the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, um, so and let me just say something about why I think it's important to name that as, to have that as a mantra or movement call. One, because it focuses on particularity. Hmm. Um, and I think we cannot run away from particularity. I actually think as we are doing planning and, and, and imagining what a just space like, might look like, difference is never ever the enemy. It should be celebrated. And a just city would actually be built around difference as a celebratory element. That is to say, when you say all lives matter and attempt to universalize or dismiss particularities, it is actually doing, it, it's going against what I imagine to be just. Um, having, to, having said that, um, what's next? Because particularities are important, one of the things that we're working on now is actually talking to people in their communities, local, lo having localized and regionalized conversations. And that looks like old school organizing, the unsexy work knocking on people's doors and, and realizing that you can live in New York City and be black or brown, and depending on your neighborhood, your lived experiences will, can be actually quite different, depending on your gender, depending on your class, depending on your ability or disability. Um, and the goal is to sort of summon or, or to collect or call a lot of those different conversations into what could look more like a, a platform or an agenda mm -hmm. that can guide the work. You should never ever drop an agenda out of the sky, which is what I think a lot of people want. Well, what is this Black Lives Matter agenda? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what media, I'm, I work in media, I know. <laughs> and I'm like, you, you want me to give you a glossy two sheet, a one sheet. <laughs> and that could work, yeah? But you would have lost you would have lost uh, the ability to sort of galvanize a collective around shared ideas without talking to them. Mm -hmm. So the harder work is not giving, all, giving up some glossy two-sheet, but actually talking to people in, online, like in, their, in their face, face-to-face, -face, and also what we're about to start doing is online canvassing. Mm -hmm. So I think what we should expect um, is a bunch of uh, practical ideas that has been called from conversation in real time with people from a variety of different perspectives who actually care and, 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 and imagine what a black, brown, woman, uh, non-heteronormative world looks like where all people can be centered. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, I want to just note the, uh, the importance of platforms, of communications, of talking to people. Um, we're very happy and, and honored to be a sponsor of the MAS Summit. 
uh, for this very reason. Uh, this is an opportunity to really talk about these issues um, that are incredibly important and also to work with these partners like Next City, uh, JMX Bond Center for Design for the Just City, I love the name, uh, and then the nature of cities. I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to really get the word out there. Um, I want to give you guys just a last word. Any last words of advice or things to you know, keep an eye on as we, as we continue to think about how to pursue the set of goals and the city that we want, right? So. Yeah, I think, uh, I like to think the city that we want is a, a city that has a landscape that we want. Um, um, green, biophilic, where people can have uh, reconnect to nature, and uh, no matter what uh, is uh, the, the background or the class or social class or economic possibilities, and this is happening in Rio. In some ways, uh, bottom-up uh, uh, um, movements are happening, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, this is uh, giving some human uh, perspective to the ecology, mm -hmm. to the, the, the processes, and that they are, they are working for better cities, mm -hmm. and uh, this is contaminating the rich people also because they are uh, gated uh, in their uh, bubbles. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I'll add that I think that, you know, the, the public imagination, our imagination is important. I don't think it's esoteric to say, um, you know, our ideological, our ideas, our imagination is just as important as the material world that we try to build. Um, because when I ask people, who's in your just city, in your imagination? Which bodies are present? Which lived experiences? So many people have trouble answering that. But I think that is a political question. We, our material spaces are the, the result of the ideological, our imaginations that we maintain. And I think we have to do some self-reflexive work to ask ourselves the tough questions of what biases are restricting the imagination that is, that is so expansive such that we can build materially just cities where all people, particularly those on the margins of society, can be centered. Yeah, and I have to agree, uh, at the Ford Foundation we are focusing on the drivers of inequality. And one of the drivers that we've really settled on that we have really tried to understand um, are the dominant cultural narratives uh, that persist throughout society, our society here in the United States, and then drive decision making, how people justify their decisions. And so um, I'm looking forward to continuing to talking with you, you all. Uh, thank you for having us uh, here at the MAS Summit, and um, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thank you.